So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say welcome to you, and I'd like to introduce to you uh, our guests um, who will bring us in a very, very important area, the digital and entrepreneurship and the overlapping combinations uh, and the different variations. We, I'm very happy that Xu Zhang from China is with us, uh, that Thomas from Singapore is with us, and Sally uh, from Denmark. And of course, uh, Jacqueline from UNESCO Univoc. Um, so I would say we start. Uh, Jacqueline, you could start with your presentation. And I will give now the gong. But ladies and gentlemen, it's 10 o'clock in the morning in all Europe. Uh, I know with Thomas, it's four hour, It's four o'clock in the afternoon in Singapore. And in China, probably would be something like that too. Um, we are a very international community here. We will be around 200 people. And I'd like to give you some ideas how you can participate very active. Please think about that you can ask any question to any speaker what you want. And you have two options for that. We have in the menu the possibility that you can write down a question in this area where there are questions collected. And the speakers can give you directly an answer or we discuss this question together later on. This is one option. And the other option is, uh, I see that a lot of you are writing down in the chat. You can write down something in the chat. I will collect these questions and we will talk about all of these questions. So I'm very happy that you are with us. And um, ladies and gentlemen, we are now starting. It's, it's a privilege for me to introduce you our three speakers of the panel today. It is Xu Zhang. She is from uh, the Polytechnic University in China. Uh, and you can also start with your presentation. Uh, she will bring us in a very cool topic because she will sh show us the interlink um, what kind of resources are important when you see on the same time the digital transformation. This will open for many of us a lot of new opportunities. Shishang, please start your presentation. Yes. Um, Milenius and gentlemen, uh, when you want to ask Shishang a question, write it down in the chat or in the area of questions. Um, we will answer each of your questions. Please do this because we want to have it so interactive as possible. Shushang, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Linda. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, greetings from China. Uh, this is Xu Zhen Zhen. Huh? Uh, dear experts, uh, dear colleagues from UNESCO Universe Center, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and uh, for organizing such a great uh, webinar series for us. Dear uh, speakers, dear uh, participants online, uh, it is really an honor for me to be here to share and also learn, of course, learn from you uh, for transforming entrepreneurship in the digital age. Um, today, uh, I will share with you a case of a nationally accredited database at Shenzhen Polytechnic University. It is called um, the National Level TVET Program Teaching and Learning Database of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Actually, this is the only nationally accredited TVET database in the field of entrepreneurship education. It is accredited by the MOB. Um, after exploring the practical implementation of case, I will share with you about how and why we can then uh, we can link and interact with resources within uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, first of all, I want to have a brief introduction on the database. I I should say this uh, construction process uh, of the database is like a journey. It went from institutional level uh, then to provincial accreditation. Uh, and finally to national accreditation. From the start um, of the institutional level accreditation, um, we uh, recognized 
the importance of the entrepreneurship ecosystem in especially like um involving contributors from different parts of the ecosystem. So uh, for the final national accreditation, we brought together 30 top domestic CVAT institutions and 11 leading enterprises in China uh, and uh, Shenzhen Polytechnic University as the leader. Well, all, uh, overall, this database we built includes several modules like um, a course module a sub-database module. Um, and then a scenario module. And of course, um, the course module has always been the core and focus of the database. And it's also the key points of our presentation today. Um, after two years of construction when it was officially accredited as a national level uh, database, um, it exceeded expectations in terms of like um, uh, numbers of users, uh, the number of resources, and uh, even its impact across um, China. So um, how and why that uh, we can link and interact with different types of resources within uh, the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem by constructing this database. So this is the question that I want to explore with you today. But uh, firstly, let's explore the how. Um, I think as a callback to the previous webinar, I want to use uh, the ELIC framework by Professor Linda to uh, explore the how. So um, as to explore the practical implication of this database projects. Uh, yes, um, the ELIC framework has 12 modules. So uh, when, uh, we, uh, when I <laughs> use this framework to explore our case, um, I found that um, some modules could be analyzed together like module one, uh, well we proposition and module three entrepreneurial competencies um, and uh, several other modules were also combined for analysis so I, so I won't ne necessarily in, introduce them in in order uh, but um, uh, rest assured all uh, 12 modules will be uh, covered for well we proposition and entrepreneurial competencies based on the rationale behind the databases uh, construction, we can see different learning outcomes are uh, expected from learners in the core course module. Uh, these are the core course module. For example, uh, in the innovation category, the goal is to develop learners innovative thinking and awareness. Uh, this is so similar to the mindset development we discussed in the previous webinar. And at the same time, uh, there is uh, the entrepreneurship category aimed at uh, building learners' professional entrepreneurial knowledge and skills. So it's mo um, module two. For module two, a uh, target group from the very beginning of construction, actually of um, the construction of the database, um, target groups were clearly defined and um, visible listed on the website. Uh, this uh, include four types, student user, teacher user, enterprise user, and social user. Uh, for module four and five, curriculum approach and key activities due, um, due to the nature of this database, most um, of the teaching activities are conducted online. Uh, specifically, it's uh, let's take the 12 core courses again as an example. Each course is a self-contained unit composed of what uh, we call granular resources like a PPT size, videos or DOC files uh, which uh, adjust specific knowledge points. Uh, this flexibility allows uh, offline courses uh, to use these re uh, resources as needed uh, during teaching or other teachers can 
uh, incorporate these uh, resources, these granular resources when creating their own online resources. Then it's about, uh, the, uh, then it's for module six, key resources. This module, key resources, is a focal point of this presentation. Uh, based on the resources from the database, in one of our studies, we constructed a conceptual framework to explore curriculum development in the digital transformation of entrepreneurship at education. This framework uh, examines the digital uh, technology uh, used in courses during uh, teaching the courses, uh, the transformation of uh, curriculum and uh, the resources from the entire entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, involved uh, in the development and the in implementation period, like uh, human resources, financial resources, knowledge resources, social resources, experience, and culture. By using this conceptual framework, we uh, focus on 12 core courses, conducting a detailed analysis of each course's syllabus, uh, learning plan, learners on my feedback so and, and, and other textual contents. During the curriculum development process, we explore the resources from the entrepreneurship uh, uh, system using this framework and uh, arrive at uh, some key findings. These are the key findings and over, overview here. Then it's for module seven and 11 core team and organizational structure. This uh, can also be examined together. From a, actually, um, from a macro perspective, we can understand organizational structure of the uh, entire database project as a, we call a, a dedicated project management team, uh, which includes uh, leadership groups, expert panels, and coordinators are working to ensure the smooth operation of the large project. And uh, at a micro level, the large project is uh, invited into sub-projects such as um, each course being a sub-project. Uh, we sign an agreement uh, with the heads of the sub-project uh, by aligning indicators and uh, allowing each sub project, uh, allowing the sub project to conduct its own project management, uh, forming core, core teams, uh, like uh, with many in instructors uh, or experts as as, as it uh, need it needs. Uh, for module A and uh, key stakeholders, we used uh, the MQC framework to understand it here uh, at three levels. The macro level includes the project initiatives and uh, approval bodies, the MOE. The macro level includes key stakeholders in the ecosystem, uh, such as uh, comedies or institutions across different fields or industries. The minor level consists of uh, the institutions we collaborate with. Uh, uh, with various Tibet institutions and enterprises. Uh, then uh, module nine and 12. Uh, to understand this uh, two module, all indicators for, um, for assessment and monitoring of the entire project are actually are, are clearly listed in the proposal submitted to the MOE at the um, first stage. Uh, this includes not only the we call the quantity and quality of the resources constructed, um, but also extended impact indicators like uh, the number of national entrepreneurship competition ma uh, medals won by the learners and the research and teaching outcomes developed from the sub-projects. Uh, finally, uh, for module 10, channels, we can see that um, this database has a large number of users with significant influence. This is uh, partly because uh, entrepreneurship education has a broad appeal as a general education, right? Uh, additionally, 
uh, this database has been integrated into a digital platform led by the MOE. Uh, it is called the National T-Web Smart Education Platform. This platform integrates very existing resources systems and platforms. It uh, also covers different levels of um, program t uh, teaching and learning databases uh, with strong promotion, uh, uh, like uh, from uh, with the help from the MOE. This database is so fortunate. Uh, it can uh, benefit a, a large uh, audience. Then it's about the why, uh, why yeah, that uh, we can link and interact with different types of resources uh, within the ecosystem. Uh, first, it is because um, we have the support from the MOE for database construction. Uh, let's take a look uh, at uh, the policy roadmap. It is the foundation for building our TIVA teaching and learning database, uh, learning basis. Uh, from the top down institutionally, we've come to fully recognize the significance of constructing such a database. For the institution itself, uh, actually to build a nationally accredited uh, TNL database uh, will gain return with a lot of, a uh, lot, a lot of benefits. However, like um, many other databases, uh, I should say this one also faces a bot bottleneck. Uh, it is uh, a sustainability. I understand that sustainability is a major challenge for many databases, but uh, uh, very fortunately, this um, database benefited from new policies and initiatives that helped it uh, leverage the resources within the ecosystem to maintain its sustainability. Uh, first up is the virtual pedagogical research hub initiative, which developed from the traditional, the traditional pedagogical research units for digital transformation. And this database uh, become the foundations uh, for constructing a virtual pedagogical research hub. We call it the Li Hu International Virtual Pedagogical Research Hub for Innovation and Entrepreneurship in TWET. About six of the 29 previous constructors uh, of the database uh, become the members of this virtual hub. And of course, there are uh, other new members joining in. Uh, moreover, the national level database has begun the uh, begun the re reaccreditation process with continued government funding to support ongoing resource development and usage. Uh, this shows strong recognition and ongoing support for the database. I uh, and I I guess uh, we are almost at the um, fifty minute mark, so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all so much uh, for your patience. That's all from me. And I will hand it over to Professor Lingner uh, for the next part. Thank you. Thank you so much. So nice from you, Shushang, that you made this presentation. Um, the first question would I have to you is, when you would have a small talk in the cafe and someone asks you, what is this databases? How can you summarize this in three sentences for us? What is the large benefit of this cool database? Um, it can, because uh, it's a, uh, we, we call it entrepreneurship. Uh, we understand this co uh, concept as a general, very general education. So it could, benefit to a very large population. So this may be um, one of the benefits I, I think it could be. Then the second is uh, the value. Uh, I think is the value that uh, it created. The, the scale of the value is very large from very general, basic, uh, just something uh, some very small value 
and then to some economic value that maybe we will value it um uh larger values. So uh we think that uh the value creation is the second uh benefits that I I can think of. And the third benefits um I think uh it is uh, like a model for uh, because uh, this database is the the only nationally accredited accredited database uh, in China, so I think it could be the mo uh, models for yeah. other uh, TVA institutions and other uh, other institutions uh, within this uh, in in entrepreneurial ecosystem. I think uh, these are the three uh, benefits that I I can think of. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, who is the major target group for the database? Because I saw you have 600, more than 600,000 uh, persons uh, who are using the database. Who is the major target group? The major target group uh, is uh, the TVAT institution, the TVAT uh, institution, mainly from China. And also some very top university like Peking University, Tsinghua University. Uh, there are also users from these uh, top university uh, are also included in the, the user the, base. The, the major target groups are persons who are working at TVET institutions, uh, teachers um, and organizers and trainers. Um, perfect. Um, you offer 12 courses in the database. How they are implemented? These are extracurricular activities. These are uh, elective uh, uh, parts, or they are obligatory. Uh, this two actually uh, the uh, the constructed or the developers of the twelve courses are from different private institutions, and some of the course uh, could be the core courses. Uh, in the faculty, or some uh, would be, uh, as you say, elected course. That is up up to the organization and the value proposition of uh, the faculty. So it means in the databases you give a good overview. What are the programs who are used from different Tibet organizations in China, um, and they are using them in different aspects. Um, these courses are not automatically digital. They are maybe in present, uh, or some of them are also digital. Okay, um, I got it. Um, when you, uh, what is your experience? How are the courses? They are more theoretically or more practical? Do the learners normally have a, a project when they are joining these kind of courses or? Do do you uh, ask the the Tibet institutions anything about that too? Uh, for the users, it's up to them. <laughs> Actually, it's, okay. it's up up to them. Okay, and um, do you ask how they make an assessment about the course? How which kind of assessment philosophy do they use in the courses in the entrepreneurship and innovation courses? Um. Uh, if it is only for the database, uh, we, we could see uh, the assessment basing on some feedbacks uh, on the platform. Okay. And uh, yeah, mainly from the feedback that we, we could see uh, regarded as a uh, SD assessment. When you say it's the largest and national uh, database, does it mean that in the database you have a a very large overview of all the offer which are existing in China, or is it uh, in an early stage where you try to increase that many, many offers are coming inside? Or is it on the stage where you say you have a good overview of the, the possibilities and the offers which are existing in China? Um, it is uh, a very large scale. Uh, you could see, uh, you could take the 12 core courses at as an example, you can see different level uh, for diff, um, the, the, the users uh, at different level. Yes. Uh, Zhuzhang, I say thanks a lot. Uh, we will do at the end uh, one more uh, questions um, when we have it all together. 
Uh, Thomas, you are here. Thomas? Yes, okay. hi. Um, Thomas, uh, is, uh, please start your presentation. I'd like to introduce Thomas. Thomas is uh, from Singapore. He is uh, on a polytechnical uh, institution, and he will bring us a super cool uh, experience from Singapore. Very often, Singapore is called as the country where the things are particular going on. So I'm very happy that you are with us and to share your experiences. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, sorry, before I begin, are you able to see my slides? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, we are delighted to be afforded this opportunity uh, on our pedagogical experience to share with you and equally to learn from your experience. My presentation today will comprise two parts. The first part is to introduce to you the context of our innovation and entrepreneurship training. And the second part is how we uh, attempt to amalgamate um, technologies like generative AI into the teaching of our uh, curriculum in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, before I continue, do allow me to introduce uh, our institution. Representing Temasek Polytechnic in Singapore, we are proud to be part of a vibrant academic community situated on a beautiful campus, catering to over 13,000 um, students across six distinct schools, offering three-year courses for the students. Our institution not only focus on nurturing young minds, but also extend our expertise to adult learners, aligning with our nation's vision to foster a culture of lifelong learning, transcending age boundaries. So in terms of the education path in Singapore, Temasek Polytechnic, as you can see, it's uh, located here uh, at the, uh, with the highlighted part. Yep, here. Okay. So it is accumulating in the progression pathway to university education. Now, next, I'll do a very quick introduction of myself. I'm Thomas, a senior lecturer with the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Department within Temasek Polytechnic which from now uh, I should refer to as TP for convenience sake. Besides uh, providing training and development, I'm also involved in curriculum development, planning for uh, competition and funding for the six schools, which I've mentioned earlier, on areas involving innovation and entrepreneurship. Accumulating from my own um, entrepreneurship experience, I was a businessman before I joined TP. I have also co-authored a book known as uh, Small and Medium Enterprise, the Business Landscape of uh, Singapore. So for today, I would like to share uh, our experience and focus in integrating generative AI technologies uh, to enhance entrepreneurship learning outcomes and learners' uh, industry readiness. Now, before I move on, uh, do allow me to share some context why adopting an innovation and entrepreneurship mindset is extremely important and critical to Singapore. Uh, because we are a very small country in terms of size and with no natural resources. We have no oil, no coal, no natural gas, and the list goes on on the things that we do not have. The only key resource we have is actually us, the hub, the people. As such, it becomes the mission of our nation to invest in human resource to make the difference. Entrepreneurial thinking hence essential, is hence essential for um, empowering our next generation to thrive in a rapidly changing world, unlocking their potential to innovate, adapt, and create value in an increasing complex and uncertain future. So in alignment with the nation's uh, goals, TP is committed to fostering a culture of uh, entrepreneurship among our students and alumni. To achieve this, we develop a three-tier comprehensive uh, entrepreneurship developmental roadmap designed to cultivate an innovative and entrepreneurial mindset. Our journey begins with tier one. So we have three tiers here, and our journey begins with tier one with a, a polytechnic-wide subject. And this subject, known as INNOVA, is a foundational module that creates awareness and sparks interest in entrepreneurship. So this is the first level. We create um, a compulsory subject for all our students and also our target group of students are age 17 to 21. So we are actually promoting the very beginning stage of uh, entrepreneurship to our students. 
Now, for those who demonstrate aptitude and enthusiasm, we offer a suite of immersive experience in Tier 2, whereby we provide activities such as hackathons, competitions, internships, and specialized programs to refine the student skills and entrepreneurial acumen. So in this stage, we allow students to apply what they have learned in stage one, especially for those who have expressed enthusiasm and keen interest to go this entrepreneurship route. Ultimately, those with great potential will reach our tier three to receive tailored support in terms of funding and mentorship to hone their strengths and propel their entrepreneurial aspiration into successful careers. So this is our three-tier uh, developmental roadmap for everybody who is interested and keen to develop innovation and entrepreneurship skills. So in a nutshell, operationally, we offer a comprehensive pathway spanning training, mentorship, networking, facility support, and funding access to empower our student entrepreneurs to achieve their dreams and build sustainable, meaningful careers that can impact lives and future. So back to our flagship subject. So you remember just now in tier one, we actually promote this subject to all our students. Now, INNOVA is a mandatory two credit unit module for all our students, encompasses three key pillars, which is innovation, which focus on solving problems and identifying opportunities, entrepreneurship, which focus on the commercialization of ideas and solutions, and finally, prototyping in our makerspace, which focus on helping students to transform concepts into tangible showcase-ready forms. Now, this accompanying video will show you that our classroom setting is not that boring at all because we focus more on hands-on activities to apply the concepts that they have learned. So this will be uh, very essential for the students to enjoy the entire process because as I mentioned earlier, what we are facing is the beginning stage of entrepreneurship journey. So we need to ensure that the students enjoy it. And uh, for example, in this video, right, we in one of our classroom activities, we transform a childhood game, which is folding paper plane into uh, exercise to allow students to understand the iteration process. So just a very short video. There you go. <laughs> yep, so welcome to the Singapore classroom. So this is one example of the tutorial that we had. Uh, tutors ask students to fold paper planes and then in groups, they will discuss about the iteration pro progress with that they will be able to help uh, improve their ideas. Okay, so this is generally the... Uh, the location that we have. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I cannot bring you around. So the ecosystem um, that we have uh, is more than the classroom setting. It involves, as you can see from our three-tier developmental roadmap, it's actually a comprehensive system that comprises many different supporting wings. So as I mentioned, unfortunately, I cannot bring you around. So uh, I bring the next best thing, which is a video recording of the facilities that we have. So enjoy the trip.
Okay, thank you. I hope you enjoy this virtual trip and have a better picture of what we are doing in our campus. Um, next, I shall share the second part of my presentation, which is uh, to share our experience in integrating generative AI into our entrepreneurship training. I have to be frank here that we are still in the planning and piloting most of the ideas. So we are in the very beginning stage whereby we try to incorporate uh, generative AI tools to the entrepreneurship training process. So which is why I find that I will be able to benefit here from the sharing that we have later. And I'm looking forward uh, for the sharing to spawn more ideas for me to be able to implement into our causes. Okay, so without further ado, um, so for this subject itself, uh, in the beginning era of uh, generative AI, we heard lots of voices on educators inevitably see um, this technology as a threat uh, on plagiarism, on possible plagiarism by students. So as such, in the beginning, we did see lots of discussion, uh, a lot of pedagogical discussion on how to curb students using generative AI to plagiarize. However, we decided to adopt a more forward-thinking approach to integrate AI into students' learning. I mean, if you can't beat them, you join them, right? First of all, we identify areas that students need improvement, which in our eyes, which is this top part, we find that our students in terms of their entrepreneurial training uh, is quite lacking in terms of their verbal communication of ideas to stakeholders their oral presentation skills, and also the identifying of insightful point of views for problems and opportunities, which is to say, in short, they miss the big picture. Now, so our objective is to pinpoint on one particular topic in our subject itself to allow students to practice and exercise uh, with the use of AI technologies to be able to improve these three areas. And we selected this topic called prototyping. And in this prototyping topic, we have a sub, uh, this uh, skill set, which is uh, storyboarding. Now, with this implementation, students will be able to integrate generative AI to deliver personalized, immersive, and uh, experiential learning, generate appropriate text prompt to create AI image from uh, generative AI tools, create AI images to express their ideas accurately. And of course, with every learning, right, we will need students to also understand the ethical use of tools. So we also incorporated the ethical and legal aspects of using generative AI tools. Now with this objective in mind, we actually set forth to uh, produce the material lesson plans, e-lecture materials and tutorial for our students. Now I, I would like to bring back uh, bring you back to my original statement that we are training at the very beginning stage of entrepreneurship. So inculcating the values and also uh, uh, providing the interest and fun factor is actually quite critical for us. So I will share with you how we actually produce and show the students about our ethical and legal aspect. So this is the slides that is being prepared uh, during for our students' learning journey whereby they will be introduced to uh, generative AI and also the risk emerging from having this and also other concerns, uh, which is like IP and copyrights rules and how does Singapore address the challenges so that they have, can gain a better perspective. We also provide them with general guidelines uh, on how to use in class. So with this understanding of the basic usage, um, um, it will be able to give them a better perspective when using the software itself. Next, the lesson plan. We incorporated generative AI uh, exercise and activities into our lesson plan, making it a must-do uh, activity for students. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm quite mindful of time. So, in, sorry about that. Now, I'm quite mindful of time, so instead of uh, going through the entire process of the materials we have, I again uh, produce uh, another video to show you uh, how we actually do it. Okay, now we start the learning process with e-lectures material where students engage in self-directed learning on the necessary information as well as being introduced to a wide array of 
gen generative AI tools, which include Meet Journey. We also provide very uh, light-hearted uh, e-lecture videos to explain how generative AI tools can be used to enhance the entrepreneurial experience. Now, all this knowledge is being accumulated. Sorry, I think the video is not playing well, so allow me to just, okay, I start from here again, which is the e-lecture videos. And all this knowledge acquired, right, will be translated to hands-on experience during the tutorial session, where students make use of generative AI imagery tools to create attractive storyboards. In the process of uh, text prompting, they actually gain a better understanding of the problems or opportunities which they are working on. So these are the work that is being created by our students in class, uh, and they have a lot of fun, trust me. Yeah, and these are the various different storyboards that are produced by our students using generative AI to iterate their process and also present to stakeholders. Naturally, we did a survey to gather students' feedback, and as you can see from the data, it has been very, very positive with students asking for more. Now, overall in this process, we made the following discovery. This entire process has allowed students to leverage on technology to create better storyboards and hence enhance them in their storytelling and also a better presentation to stakeholders. Secondly, it actually made students realize that now they have more options to achieve success in their work and entrepreneurial learning journey. Thirdly, they somehow learn to communicate very effectively. In this case, is when entering text prompts. They are no longer very careless in giving instructions and they are more meticulous in their thinking to create good prompts for, to generate good images for their storyboard. And finally, they are encouraged to think deeper and more holistically in their ideation process with the help of technology. Now, besides uh, the implementations, um, many more projects are in the pipeline. Now, education is not only about seeing it from the learn learner's perspective. We also look into the teaching perspective. So some of the uh, very exciting projects that is on the way includes, as you can see here, the first one is um, our e-lecture videos creation. Now, as you can see just now from our videos, right, we create very interesting e-lecture videos to our students, but that takes a lot of time and effort and uh, also manpower resources. Now, in order to uh, make it more efficient in such production, we have uh, explored uh, different software such as uh, Synthesia, HeyGen, uh, just two examples of the many, many software that we can use to create videos in a very time and resource efficient manner. We are also exploring using uh, generative AI uh, to assist us in our lesson plan development and also in assessment planning. Um, they will definitely not take over the beautiful brains of our lecturers and teachers because that is the core of our creativity. However, they will provide a very, very strong uh, supplement and support uh, to our thinking process in this uh, lesson plan development and assessment planning. From the learner's perspective, we have actually implemented the first one, which is what I've just shared with you, using text prompts to generate output for uh, assignment and class activities. Uh, and we are also trying to allow our students for the next semester to use ChatGPT as a research and idea generation tool. Besides that, we are also using um, this uh, process as a formative assessment option uh, because we believe that creation reflects understanding. So we will allow our students to use generative AI's creation process to assess their learning progress because if you know more, you'll be able to create more comprehensive output uh, using generative AI. Yes. So uh, that is what I have to share right now. Thank you very much for your time and I hope to receive the feedback from you later. Thank you. Thomas, thanks a lot. I have immediately some questions. We got, uh, I have several questions to your very, very interest um, talk. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very impressed that you offer to all students innovation and entrepreneurship courses and the possibility to use the makerspace how do you organize this? Because uh, you have 13,000 students at all. 
And it means you have maybe a lot of students in some of the courses, or do you have the courses very often? How is this organized? Okay, yeah, you, you are definitely right, uh, Johannes, because uh, managing 13,000 students is not easy. But uh, luckily, we have the semesters. So we break them into two different groups. So there will be uh, one half from one semester and the other half. However, when we talk about 13,000, I'm talking about, uh, you know, three different levels. Sure, so sure. all the students will come in, it's in the introduction level. So that will be around uh, 4,000 plus. So when we divide 4,000 plus into two different semesters, it each will be about around 2,000 plus. And how do we organize them? We will form them into around, uh, if I'm not wrong, about 180 classes. And these 180 classes will be taught by three different groups of tutors. Number one, full-timers like myself. Number two, school associates, whereby, you know, in the other schools, we have tutors who has also very good entrepreneurship experience. And we will rope them in to teach our students. And thirdly, from the industry partners. We have very, very good industry partners who are practitioners with very good heart to give back what they have gotten from the society. So they actually join us to also teach the students. Now, for the maker space, the space, as you can see, I already told you that Singapore is very small. So everything is very small. <laughs> so the space is very limited. So we have to do very creative timetabling to allow all students to have an experience in terms of the uh, experience in the maker space. Yep. Thanks a lot. Um, as you mentioned that uh, the use of generative uh, artificial intelligence, you're also in the beginning, but we have some colleagues uh, who ask, what would be your advice in which area they should start? In which area? In okay. which area of how, do, in which classes or in which kind of entrepreneurship area or innovation area would you start with artificial intelligence? Is it uh, the storyboard particular or is it up to the assessment where you mentioned that you are thinking to use artificial intelligence? I see. So, so as what we have experienced, right, uh, we did some uh, study on it and then we decide to go. My, my, my sharing will be uh, if you wish to choose a place, uh, I think everything starts still from the ped pedagogical needs instead of the tools, because the tools is just there to support the pedagogical needs. So I think if we start, uh, which is what we did, we identify the three different areas that we are, the students are quite lacking in, which is the communication skills, the presentation skills. And then from there, we try to develop uh, and also based on our understanding and knowledge to identify tools that are able to support this. So in this instance, right, we realize that we have a subtopic, which is storyboarding and storyboarding requires image. And what best to generate the image is, you know, before generative AI, we ask students to draw physically. So what we get is a lot of stick men. And then, you know, not all of us are artistic in nature. So what happened is uh, some of them, after they painted the storyboard, uh, none of us could understand what they are trying to express. However, with this uh, generative AI tools, we realize that all of them are more confident in presenting their storyboards. Yeah. So I, I would say we start from the pedagogical uh, uh, needs first, and then from there, try to match the tools that can enhance this with the topics that are being taught. I like this answer a lot, that you take a look what the, what are really the needs of the target group. And in this area you are starting, it's a very, very nice uh, uh, answer. Um, maybe in that combination, you mentioned you have around 180 courses at the same time. Uh, some of the colleagues asked, how do you qualify your trainers? Because uh, if you have these tremendous changes, which you also like to in, in integrate it, how, how, do you have a tr special training programs for the yes. trainers, for the, for the, yeah. It would be great so, if you can share this a bit with us. Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked because uh, as, as the subject leader myself, uh, it is not an easy job. So other than managing the students, I also have to manage the, the trainers. So it's double management. So what happened is uh, we actually make our job easier through a, a very careful recruitment process. So uh, as I mentioned just now, other than full-timers, we also engage uh, part-time industry practitioners to join us in this teaching process. So we, uh, uh, we, we actually recruit very carefully and ensure that we only get those with very relevant, relevant experience. Um, just to share, one of the uh, 
the key uh, content that we are teaching students in innovation is the design thinking methodology. I believe a lot of people heard of the design thinking methodology. So when we uh, actually engage students, we ensure that they have knowledge in this area or even um, experience in this area. So when they come in, we will actually conduct a three-day train the trainer program for them. And all of them must attain, attend this program before they are qualified to teach. And separately, our Polytechnic has an even longer duration accreditation course for all trainers. So this is more mainly on the general pedagogy uh, or training. So our tutors, before they start, they'll be equipped with specific knowledge of uh, the subject INNOVA so that they are capable to teach. Secondly, they also have amassed uh, a, a good amount of pedagogical theories and ideas because not all of them are trained pedagogically. So, but with the training that is provided by our Polytechnic, they will be uh, certified to teach uh, in terms of this. And yeah, so this, this is the area whereby we ensure that they are competent in at least this. Sec there's also another factor, which is the more informal and intangible one, which is they must all have storytelling skills. I think storytelling is a very important skill because uh, no students want to go into the classroom listening to the tutors talking about point one, point two, point three, point four. What we need are tutors who can use point one to four to create a story and tell. So just to share, in order to showcase entrepreneurship, uh, I, I actually bought a, a electronic guitar from Shenzhen, which is a very highly innovative product. And I have to play the guitar and sing song in class to impress them. Yeah. So that's the idea we have to go to just arouse the interest among them. Yes. Thomas, thanks a lot. This was a very, very nice answer and a very good uh, impression that it's of course it's needed to train the, the, the colleagues who are training the, the, the next generation of learners and the next generation of entrepreneurs. Uh, thanks a lot for this. You have a couple of questions in Ku and I. A couple of colleagues like to cooperate with you, and maybe you like to answer some of these questions. Um, sure, sure. Thanks a lot. We see you in the final round. Now I'd like to introduce to you Sally. Sally is coming from Copenhagen and is also sharing uh, our her experiences with us. Um, and Sally, please start your presentation, uh, share with us. And uh, she's from an institution which is called Lulu Lab. Uh, so you, you hear laboratorium, so it means it will be very, very practical there. Uh, the stage is yours, Sally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Johannes. And uh, hi, everyone. I am Sally, and uh, I will share um, an entrepreneurial example, I guess, um, and share a bit about Lululab's uh, journey. Um, I have um, a background in organizational innovation and entrepreneurship. And I co-founded Lululab um, seven years ago. Lululab is a global innovation studio. We co-design and develop educational games on taboo topics like um, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, and we do this with our young end users. You see some of them in the photo. Um, our young end users mainly in northeastern uh, West Africa. And we work closely with um, international NGOs and uh, different foundations. I will be sharing a bit about um, our approach of using design thinking, as Thomas was also talking about, and uh, using co-creation to um, develop educational games. And maybe this can inspire your work in, the, in teaching uh, in general and teaching entrepreneurship as well. So our idea first started at a hackathon back in uh, 2017, actually when I graduated university. And um, the hackathon was uh, with the challenge to come up with a tech solution to educate girls in Sub-Saharan Africa on sexual and reproductive health and rights because there were so many girls dropping out of school. And uh, we came up with the idea of a game and um, the NGOs that were hosting the hackathon really liked the idea. So we kept on working on it and um, developed a prototype, uh, which is basically a very simple version of a, um, of a game on pregnancy. And uh, we, we got invited to Kenya and Ethiopia, Ethiopia with a few different NGOs to test and to 
uh, co-create this game. So we tested it on uh, Android smartphones, as you see on the photos, and we facilitated a few simple co-creation workshops where we asked the local girls and boys in, for example, the slum areas of in the um, outside Nairobi, um, we asked if you were a character in a game, how would you, what would you like to look like? And we asked them to draw uh, different characters and background settings. And we also um, co-created some content, educational content for the game by asking the girls and boys questions, um, well, different quizzes we had prepared, interviews, uh, focus group discussions, and we collected all of these insights, insights which were typically very um, simple, like they had questions like, how do I use a sanitary pad? Um, and uh, we collected all of these insights and turned it into our very first uh, game, which is called Story. Show you a video here. And the novel's journey is um, based on interactive storytelling where you follow a girl called Lulu who just got her first period. Um, Lulu can ask questions to Lance and Mary and they can play different mini games and puzzles and watch videos on how to use the different scenes. Based on our field work in Kenya and Ethiopia, we created these 10 African characters. And the setting of the game is also inspired from our own photo. Ethiopia and hospital clinics and so on to make sure that we design and create this safe learning environment that our users can relate to when exploring this taboo topic that menstrual hygiene is. Um, we've implemented this game uh, mainly in Kenya and have later um, gone on to scale from this one game level to five in partnership with Save the Children in Sierra Leone and later with Bragg in Uganda and this year also with Plan International in Togo, so in French, and with SOS in Rwanda and we're currently just launching these two games. Um, this game level is about uh, sexual co um, education, comprehensive sexual education, targeting, um, also a young girls and boys, young men and women, and focusing on the challenge of teenage pregnancy, um, the very high level of teenage pregnancy in East and, and especially in, in West Africa. Um, so we've gone on to co-design these games as well. Um, it's called Dilemma Game. We have another video here. The Dilemma Game invites users on a journey to explore local town opportunities. Throughout the game, the users are met with relatable co-created dilemmas and learning flows where they can try out different educational places, uh, are met with storytelling, interactive videos and mini games that will educate them on topics like sexual rights, contraceptives and STIs, puberty, pregnancy, and also children's rights. Um, the gameplay is teaching users how their decisions can have consequences and how these decisions may affect oneself or one's patient, um, maybe even one's family. Ready in our very initial user tests, the design thinking about that again, we could see how the dilemma game makes users reflect about their decisions and reconsider their future decisions and so when making them in similar situations outside the screen. We're dealing with really big taboo topics, so we've designed a game that they can play online on a tablet uh, in a group setting because then we've discovered how the game works more as dialogue tool, uh, creating this safe learning environment again, where they can um, suddenly they feel safe actually in maybe sharing personal questions or um, ask a question about the story they heard from the community. Maybe they actually start talking about this amongst each other. Maybe a little bit of a long video, so I, um, I will just go. 
to the next slide because I really want to dive a little deeper into our uh, co-design process that might uh, inspire you. If you are not already using co-creation, maybe you can uh, share that in the chat. That would be really interesting to hear. I saw that we have some different um, um, people joining from, from uh, um, West Africa. Um, and um, yeah, I want to take you through how we initiate every game development process. We go to this given country, Sierra Leone or Rwanda, and we spend a few weeks there uh, understanding the local culture, understanding how this challenge of teenage pregnancy is experienced and perceived in the different communities that we target with the game. And we facilitate these co-creation workshops. Um, for example, the first photo is from Freetown in Sierra Leone. We invited a group of young people from different um, urban and slum areas. Uh, and we invited them for a storytelling workshop, actually. So we, we, we created some small groups and asked them to create stories about how they experienced teenage pregnancy um, in their community. Uh, we asked them to include characters and other different elements because we wanted to uh, use uh, these stories um, and these insights uh, yeah, as insights to um, implement into the game. So um, this was not only a, a storytelling uh, skills workshop for them, but it was also a way for us to understand how is the challenge perceived locally? What kind of wording do they use to talk about teenage pregnancy? Which characters are involved? Where does it take place? All of these elements that we will then um, implement in the game. And um, the second photo is um, a photo from one of our many field visits. This is from a slum area in, in Freetown. Um, and th that green bucket, for example, we've used this uh, uh, lovely color uh, combination to design the buttons in, um, in the Dilemma game. So just like a small element that actually turns into something very important in the game. And the third photo uh, is also a very, this is my favorite part. Um, we always invite our end users to be a part of creating all the audio in the game. So here you see my co-founder Matilde recording a song that uh, in Jinja, Uganda. These young people have, uh, some of them uh, have made some electronic music, others have uh, created songs that we record and then we implement that as background music in the game. We also invite them to be the voices of the game. So we have some young characters in the game, we have some older characters, and then we invite them to, to represent some of these characters. And then we know it's a local accent, it's local words, and it's a relatable and understandable for the end users from their communities who will be playing it. Um, this makes them also very proud ambassadors of the game later on. So it's been very powerful for implementation. Um, Yes, we also ask them to go to the local market, school, um, villages, and record um, audio um, and background noise, basically, that we also implement in the game. We have a market location in the game, and we have the, uh, the authentic noise from the market, which is just um, really nice. Um, and the last photo is from a mood board session. Uh, we were getting creative and asked some end users to portray their communities, portray their homes. And we've, we give them a pile of newspapers and magazines. And then they, um, uh, yeah, then we, we, uh, we ask them to present if they feel comfortable. And then they, um, they, they share how, uh, what's important for them in their community. Who is there? What are they doing? Uh, how, where, how do they go about with their day? And we implement all of these small insights into the game as well. And uh, in general, all of this co-creation really helps us ensure that we create a solution. We're based in Copenhagen, Denmark, so we're far away from our end users. So it's so important for us that we create a solution that is mindful of local traditions, religion, politics, and so on. Uh, in one of the countries, we had to change the color of the t-shirts of one of the characters because uh, it represented a political party. And um, there are small things like these that we learn on the way and um, are, uh, be, be become aware of. We have uh, in Lululab developed uh, three big games. Uh, you've seen two of them now. I'll just focus on the um, Dilemma game, which we have just scaled organically through NGO partnerships. 
Um, these numbers are only from Sierra Leone with Save the Children. Uh, we have around 50,000 users. Save the Children have done a great job uh, implementing uh, this game actively um, using, uh, using tablets, using Android smartphones, and they've had a great reach. And we're very excited to see how it's going to go with, in, uh, with Plan and SOS now in Togo and Rwanda. Um, just to dive a little deeper into Sierra Leone, I want to share some very uh, exciting impact results that we have just received from a call uh, with Save the Children, um, who informed us how the Dilemma Game, uh, as part of a bigger program of um, campaigning and advocacy work, uh, we have contributed to reduce unwanted teenage pregnancies and STI spreading. In Sierra Leone, we've taught more young people about uh, contraceptives. Um, so more people, more young people are now using contraceptives. Uh, fewer young people are also sexually active, uh, not sexually active at an early age. Uh, and fewer young people are experiencing gender-based violence. And in general, there's been a big increase in awareness and knowledge within um, sexual and reproductive health and rights. So this is a huge milestone for us. We're very proud and um, we're very excited to see what the next game rollouts will bring of impact results. This was a bit about Lululab. Thank you so much for uh, your time. I hope this inspired you a little bit to use co-creation and design thinking uh, in your work or maybe even educational games. Also, um, also a lot of fun for students and young people. Thank you. Celis, thanks a lot for your uh, for your case, uh, for your sharing of your experiences. Uh, when I would uh, have immediately some questions to you, um, I like a lot that you are doing this co-design process. Um, I think that's an important learning for everyone who is creating a course at a university or at a, a vet college, that you have to get in touch with the needs of the learners. Um, mm -hmm. How do you select the participants uh, th th that they in this uh, co-designing process? Um, how how can you do this? Yeah, what for is sure. your experience, which you think that's super important uh, to select the right persons? Yeah, I mean, you want to ensure diversity for sure. Both in, I mean, who are you targeting in general? What's your age group? Um, I don't know if if gender is important. Um, uh, but some representatives, if you have different nationalities, for example, make sure you include uh, uh, a little bit of uh, everything. So um, we, of course, have our local partners that help us select because we um, it's it's important that is also someone who's comfortable sharing uh, their thoughts and sharing their learnings. Um, but in general, we try to choose someone from rural areas, urban areas, slum areas, because we want our solution to work in all of these different areas. And, and the local challenges of, for example, teenage pregnancy might be very different or how they speak about it might be very different because some might not at all speak about it. Some might recognize it as um, a big issue and so on. So um, a little bit of both different ages, different gender, um, different... Uh, um, super cool. Yeah. I think that's super important, uh, this learning diversity, um, mm. because when you have a diverse uh, target group, you have to involve them in the diversity. Um, I'm very impressed uh, that you have shown us that with the game, you are a mindset changer, because uh, in entrepreneurial learning, we are talking a lot about mindset change. Um, mm. How, uh, which element of the game are particular able to do this? Uh, and how can you uh, say this is uh, super important when you want to create a gamification aspect that you involve these areas, uh, that a game has really the aspect that uh, you can really change mindset? Yeah, I think for, for us, uh, for sure, the gameplay, there's a bit of about you, you get more points or you lose some points, depending on which decisions you make, because it's based, it's called a dilemma game. So it's based on these dilemmas. So if you choose uh, A, uh, it might affect your education positively because you said no to a temptation. Uh, or if you choose B, then oh, maybe you won't spend the day in school, but you'll spend it doing something you maybe that will not affect your education positively. 
And so they have some levels on education, friends and family that go up and down. And I think that's um, in the gameplay, that's a big part of like showing them how your decisions every day has consequences in the long run. And um, and and then for sure also this uh, busting taboos, I think because we, we've, we designed it to be played on a tablet together with other people, then it's suddenly like you need to interact with someone on this topic. You create a dialogue around it. You can share your own questions. And this whole having a conversation around a topic that's otherwise so taboo has also really been a game changer uh, locally that more people recognize the problem, more people share their questions about personal health or what to do in this difficult situation. And um, yeah, I think that's some of the things that have contributed to, yeah. Thanks a lot for that. Um, another question is, um, it is a, a game has, in particular a digital game has the possibility for scale up. And you mentioned that you also um, do very empathic uh, changes uh, from country to country. Congratulations for that. Um, how resource intensive is uh, this game development process for you mm -hmm. and for the customer? And for yeah, um, hi, yeah, that's a great question. How to answer that? <laughs> well, thank you. And um, I think it it depends on where you. Um, I mean, is is it a new country based in East and West Africa where we already have a lot of experience? Uh, we do see quite big changes in terms of how, or big differences in terms of how they uh, they frame teenage pregnancy issues and um, how they talk about it in across East and West Africa. Of course, it's very different locations. Um, so it's it's uh, because we also included audio in the game. It's uh, that makes it a little bit of a heavier task to um, contextualize it because there's a lot of recording and translation, and you don't just translate it directly, right? We all know that it's a lot of working with the different words and creating um, proper uh, sentences that have a real impact and. Um, storytelling has to be localized um, but overall sexual education is very similar globally so um, yeah yeah how to answer the question of how how much resources how, how, how much time did it take uh, to do this just to have, get a feeling about that maybe and how, how many persons were involved uh, to create it Yeah, um, I would say it takes a few months uh, contextualizing, translating all the educational content. We work closely with the local NGOs, um, and we uh, and they they also have a, a lot of work in this because they they help with the translation and so on. And um, yeah, so a, a few months usually. A few months and two three persons who are really doing this for these three months or a more. Um, I would say uh, uh, my co-founder and I from our team and then um, a few a few um, colleagues in the local um, from the local NGO staff. Um, I, if they do it part-time or full-time, I cannot fully answer. <laughs> But we have a, I think we get a feeling that it's three months is a time uh, yeah. where, where some other institution also get, get, get a feeling, okay, that's something what we could do. But of course you need two very qualified uh, colleagues like from Lululab. Uh, sure. Sally, it was a pleasure to talk to you. I would also yeah. invite Thomas and Shi Zhang for the final round that we all come together. Please um, come back. Thomas is here, Shi Zhang is here. Um, my ladies and gentlemen, we had today three examples um, where Shi Zhang did show us a very impressive database what they have developed in China to give an overview of all these activities which are going on in the field of entrepreneurship on Tibet, in the Tibet area uh, in, in China. Congratulations for that. Um, Thomas, it gives us a, a super cool, impressive um, ex sharing of experiences of an institution who is offering for all students innovation and entrepreneurship courses. Really very cool that you are doing this. And, and how you bring artificial intelligence inside. And that you did show us that you start in an area where uh, 
the largest need we're existing from the from the learner's perspective, which I really like that you were that empathic to start in this area. And I'm sure there will come a lot of other areas. Some colleague asked immediately, oh, digital business models, how could I use artificial intelligence for that? Um, and Sally um, made a really very, very nice uh, sharing of experiences, how you can create a co-design process uh, for creating a game in a taboo area, which you uh, mentioned. Uh, therefore, I think it's super nice that you were empathic in this co-design uh, process. And I think that's super important because when we mentioned several times design thinking, uh, design thinking always includes uh, the, the perspective from the customer, from the target group. Therefore, you need this kind of co-design. Uh, and so often our learners uh, have a really cool idea, a cool, uh, impressive product, and they develop the product immediately and never talk to the customer or to the potential customer. It's, it's always a quite, uh, it's, a, it, it's an important uh, learning that we can give to our, all our learners that cool design is super important. Me, ladies and gentlemen, you have the final round, maybe to ask some questions to the colleagues. Um, Many of the colleagues uh, say thanks a lot for sharing the experiences. I hope you saw the individual uh, questions uh, that they would like to have your emails to get in touch with you and mm, ask for potential corporations, whatever you, you have to deal with in, your, in the direct uh, dialogue. And um, let us finalize from your perspective. What is super cool for a TBIT organization when they are in a bit more earlier stage than you. Um, what would you advise? Which are the areas where you should start, which is super important that your learners uh, should take in an entrepreneurship class? Um, Thomas, maybe I, I'll start with you. What would you, uh, how did you start when you implemented entrepreneurship education, entrepreneurial learning uh, in your, your institution? And would you do it this in the same way again, or would you do it now different? Uh, okay, thanks. It will always be different because uh, just share one very good example is that when I started planning for the, the generative AI lesson, it was in um, April. And by the time we reach May, when the semester has just started, um, you know WhatsApp, uh, if you are using WhatsApp, the app uh, from Meta, uh, they already have a generative AI tool within WhatsApp itself, whereby students can actually generate image through there and they do not need to go to software such as, you know, uh, all these different software to, to, to do the imagery. So times are changing very, very fast. So if I were to do uh, certain things again, I definitely will have to adopt a very more flexible path because as we all know, I'm not sure about you, but when we plan our lesson plans and pedagogical documents, they are somewhat uh, rigid and uh, a little bit restrictive. So so in order to change it, we need time. But but time is no longer on our side if we are doing, dealing with technologies and things like that. So we have to devise ways whereby we are able to come up with more flexible uh, flexibility and also more uh, fluid kind of planning. That That's one. And secondly is also uh, because we are teaching, as you rightly put it, we are training the very early stage of uh, the young entrepreneurs. We need I, I, So I find that the inculcation of knowledge is not as important as arousing their interest. And, and from the arousal, uh, this, this interest creation, right, uh, I believe they will have a more lifelong impression of entrepreneurship and this is very useful to them because a lot of our students, just, just to share, they see their own domain expertise as more important than the mindset of innovation and entrepreneurship. So uh, engineering students or IT students will tell me, I'm here to learn IT, I'm here to learn uh, you know, engineering. Uh, why are you teaching me to be innovative? I, I don't need that. So, so we, we do receive a lot of such things from our students. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, Xie Xing, um, you were sharing with us this very smart uh, data prices. Um, could you give two recommendations to our colleagues? Why they also should create a database comparing to your one in their own country? Why this would be a really uh, has a good effect? And you mentioned 
uh, in the beginning of your speech that entrepreneurship education is super important in China. Uh, could you give this in more general? Why is it that important? Also in China, which is uh, it's a country which has such an economic development, why is it still so important? Uh, I think uh, if it is for the developer or the teachers or the institution, uh, I think it is important to, that uh, we can uh, construct such a network by building such a database. So so that, uh, that's the second uh, is to have the ongoing learning from each other, then uh, we will be better and getting better and better. I like this answer a lot because one of the colleagues asked how we can, through the corporation, uh, increase their own capacity building in their own organization. But I think it's super important to have a network in their own country, a network of colleagues who have comparable challenges like to create an entrepreneurship program in their own vet college or uh, uh, at a university. And uh, a database gives them an overview, a good overview. Um, why is entrepreneurship education so important in China? Um, I think uh, the focus should be the mindset uh, development. So uh, Maybe in some area they still are uh, confused about uh, what it is uh, entrepreneurial education. They just equal it to e economics uh, or money. But uh, um, we we think that uh, the value creation will be the the focus point. So um, so so that's uh, what I as what what we. Uh, try to uh, disseminate his uh, understanding to, to all. Thanks yeah. a lot, Yushan, uh, for this very important answer that uh, entrepreneurship education is a mindset uh, changer on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's a value creation pedagogic. And it's super important that this is not just only for people who are study business, it's for so many different areas uh, where you are jumping in. Um, Sally, um, I would like to ask you, um, what are your most important learnings when you think, okay, I would now start a co-designing process? How would you start with that? Um, yes, well, well, hopefully you have a challenge as in, uh, you know, in entrepreneurship, you, you need some sort of idea. You need a, a topic, of course, to to start out with, and then um, I I would um, I would start out with a workshop and invite end users, invite uh, uh, subject experts, um, and explore the problem that you're trying to solve with them. Um, and before going to this, actually creating a solution, there's a whole you know there's so much happening before that understanding the problem understanding the target audience what are their needs uh, what are their preferences in terms of that product or service that you want to um create and um and uh, a little bit like a design sprint i guess is a good way to also um explore um, uh, different uh, solutions uh, share your ideas that's basically what you what you would want from your um, the people you invite for your co-design workshop. Sally, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for that. I'd like to make a final round for you, and I would like to start with uh, Xu Zheng. Uh, what uh, are your most important learnings in your work which you would like to share with the colleagues uh, to oh. foster entrepreneurial learning and the mindset uh, work? What is super important for you? Uh, I think um, uh, it's the, I think is to make more mistakes. Uh, let, let me give you an example in our uh, institution and maybe in many other universities that I know, of course, uh, there are um, dedicated uh, entrepreneurship in incubators uh, for students, for the learners. These are places uh, where they can make mistakes. 
uh, we provide uh, free spaces and uh, on demand guidance. Uh, the only thing uh, the learners need to do is make mistakes, I think. Thanks a lot, Shuzhen. Um, Sally, what is your um, thing where you say, ah, that's super important. Please take attention to that. In terms of uh, learning entrepreneurship? Yeah, learning entrepreneurship, learning uh, to try something, uh, uh, mm -hmm. to, to be really hands-on, like Thomas said before, and not theoretically only. Yeah, I think the, the best thing you can do is to uh, not be shy, share your ideas, share it with the world, uh, share it with your neighbor, um, share it with whoever you run into, your professor, um, because then you get feedback and this is what you need, right? It's also what co-creation is about. Like you need to hear, okay, um, does anybody, would anyone be interested in this? Or would they be interested in like a, a slight pivot of my idea? And, and all of these um, insights you can gather if you dare to share your ideas with a big audience or just with them. Um, um, I'm not going to say your, your mother, but um, um, <laughs> someone in university. <laughs> the mom effect. Uh uh, yeah. Sally, uh, thanks a lot for that. And I think we also can have a learning about that super for our learners, but it's also super for us. Uh, therefore, once again, Shuzhan mentioned the network effect. Uh, I think this brings the things together. We need a network where we can also talk about what would be the next step in the developing and fostering entrepreneurial learning for our students. How can we integrate artificial intelligence? I think that's the reason why we are sharing our experiences to be open and to see uh, when, when you are preparing a talk like that, you also have the effect that you bring something on the focus uh, where you are sometimes in the daily routine uh, and you can share it with you. Thomas, what is your learning? Uh, what you would like to share with the colleagues as the final uh, word in this uh, webinar today? I, I think from my experience, uh, two things. Number one, it must come from the heart. And uh, secondly, uh, it's we must be student-centric. In fact, uh, being student-centric is, is very universal, but I, I, I find out that uh, from entrepreneurship perspective, because teaching entrepreneurship is a very unique proposition as compared to teaching other more technical subjects. It is a soft skill whereby you need a lot of breaking the rules, as uh, uh, all of us have, have mentioned, breaking the rules, thinking out of the box, you know. And how do you inculcate this kind of uh, mindset to our students, who most of them in Singapore, especially actually, they have been trained to follow a very specific framework whereby they can excel in that framework. So how do we bring them out of it? Because uh, the challenges that I face is immediately after my class, the students are brought back to reality whereby they have to follow the framework again. And when they come to my class, they are asked to think out of the box. So I, I don't think we should confuse our youth, but we have to think of a very effective way so that they are able to switch on and on uh, when they are learning entrepreneurship. Uh, that is my realization of uh, you know teaching entrepreneurship as an experience. This is a super cool closing uh, aspect. I like a lot this heart effect and the student-centric that's uh, super crucial in our area. Thanks a lot for that. Um, maybe we are doing a final picture together, uh, some action on the picture, and then I say to the colleagues, bye-bye. See you next week on the, on the 3rd of September. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure to talk to you and see you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.